Hello and welcome to Mickeyology, where we take Disney movies a little too seriously. Today we're examining one of my favorite characters of all time, Zorro. This is Zorro, aka Don Diego de la Vega. He's a rich, young Spanish aristocrat living in Los Angeles, California in the early 1800s, a time before California was U.S. soil. When corrupt military men take over his town and oppress the people, he creates a new identity for himself. He calls himself El Zorro, and whenever there's trouble in town, he dons a mask, straps on his sword, saddles up his trusty steed, Tornado, and rides out from the cave beneath his hacienda to go defend the innocent. He's basically the world's first superhero. He had a secret identity, a costume, a sidekick named Bernardo, various villains to fight, usually unjust military commanders stationed in town, and even a trademark. He carves the letter Z onto walls, doors, and even onto his enemies. This mark is his way of letting citizens and criminals know that he's watching over Los Angeles. When I was seven, Disney Channel showed reruns of the old Zorro TV show as part of their late night programming. One night I tuned in partway through an episode. When I saw a man in a mask and cape ride out on a black horse and then cross swords with bad guys, I was hooked. I asked my parents to record every episode of Zorro from then on, and I rewatched those tapes over and over. I even dressed as Zorro for Halloween, complete with an eyeliner mustache. While there are other Zorro fans out there, we're a dying breed these days. Zorro was a very popular character, however, he inspired many other characters that eclipsed him in popularity, and since it's been a long time since he's appeared on screen, many people today, especially kids, are unfamiliar with the character. Even if you do know Zorro, you probably haven't read his first adventure. Zorro debuted in 1919 in a magazine story called The Curse of Capistrano. Author Johnston McCulley then published the story as a novel with a much snappier title. He called it The Mark of Zorro. In the 1950s, Walt Disney purchased the rights to The Mark of Zorro. He produced a high-budget Zorro TV show for ABC. And in 1958, Disney stitched together material from the show's first season to create a feature film they called The Sign of Zorro. So, how does the Disney movie compare to the original novel? Let's compare The Mark and a Sign of Zorro and examine one of Disney's most underappreciated characters. Structure. The book The Mark of Zorro is a five-part magazine serial compiled into a novel. It's an episodic story about an outlaw named Zorro who battles injustice in old Spanish California while wooing a lovely senorita named Lolita Pulido. The movie The Sign of Zorro is a 13-episode TV storyline edited into a feature film. It's an episodic story about an outlaw named Zorro who battles injustice in old Spanish California and seeks to overthrow a local dictator named Capitan Monastario. Characters The protagonist of both the novel and the movie is Don Diego, aka Zorro. Diego is basically a proto-Bruce Wayne. He's rich, handsome, and pretends to be an inept fop more interested in reading poetry than defending his town from the villains who've overrun it. However, he's really a skilled fighter who wants to battle injustice. He creates a new identity modeled on an animal, Zorro means fox in Spanish. He wears a black mask and cape, and rides out by night to fight injustice and defend the oppressed. Just as Batman had Alfred, Diego has Bernardo, a loyal manservant who knows his master's secret identity and helps Zorro on his missions. In the book, Bernardo is deaf and mute, and Diego talks at the poor guy whenever he needs to think out loud. In the movie, Bernardo is mute, but he only pretends to be deaf. That way, he can eavesdrop on people for Diego without raising suspicion. Diego's father is Don Alejandro, a Spanish aristocrat who doesn't know his son's secret identity, believes Diego is a coward, and is disappointed in him. The book features Sergeant Gonzalez, a mean, boastful soldier who's Don Diego's friend, but Zorro's enemy. The movie trades Sergeant Gonzalez for Sergeant Garcia, a kind, bumbling soldier who serves as comic relief. The villain of the book is Captain Ramon, a lying scoundrel who hates Zorro and lusts after the beautiful Lolita. 
The villain of the film is Capitan Monastario, a tyrant who rules the pueblo of Los Angeles with an iron fist. Of course, Zorro wouldn't be much of a hero without someone to save. In both the movie and the book, the authorities persecute a local family and they need Zorro's help. In the book, their name is Pulido, while in the film, their name is Torres. While both families consist of a mother, a father, and a daughter, the daughter character is much more prominent in the book than she is in the Disney film. Plot. While both versions of Zorro feature similar characters, the plots of the two stories are quite different. The novel begins on a stormy night in Old California, where a Sergeant Gonzalez is drinking at the local tavern, boasting about how he plans to capture the masked vigilante known as Zorro. Gonzalez's friend, the foppish Diego Vega, gets tired of all this Zorro talk and leaves the inn. Moments later, Zorro appears at the inn. He's come to punish Gonzalez for mistreating some local Indians, and after besting the sergeant in a duel, he flees into the night. The next morning, Diego visits the Pulido Hacienda. He tells Don Carlos Pulido that his father's pressuring him to get married, so he asks for the hand of Don Carlos' daughter, Lolita. Lolita herself balks at Diego's passionless proposal, and Diego leaves. However, a new suitor soon arrives at the house. Zorro comes to woo Lolita, and he even holds her parents hostage just so he can visit her. However, Don Carlos summons the local soldiers to arrest Zorro, and Zorro must duel the soldier's leader, Captain Ramon. Zorro wins the duel and flees the house. Captain Ramon, meanwhile, also becomes smitten with Lolita, and asks her father for her hand. However, Lolita isn't interested in Ramon or Diego. She's in love with the mysterious Zorro. Ramon soon visits Lolita while she's alone at a hacienda and tries to assault her. Luckily, Zorro appears and forces Ramon to apologize before throwing him out. The grateful Lolita then kisses Zorro, leaving most of his face still concealed. Then our hero vanishes into the night, leaving Lolita standing there like a girl who's just Frenched a guy upside down in the rain. Back at the barracks, an angry Ramon writes a letter to the governor accusing the Pulidos of treason. Zorro tries to stop the letter from going out, but the soldiers chase him away. One night, Diego's father, Don Alejandro, hosts a group of caballeros at his home. Diego excuses himself from the party, and just after he leaves, Zorro appears and persuades the men to join him in his quest for justice. The men agree, calling themselves the Avengers. However, the governor soon arrives in town, and he has the Pulidos arrested. Zorro and his new team must break the Pulidos from jail and escape Ramon and his soldiers. After many chases, Zorro kills Ramon and finds himself trapped with Lolita inside the tavern with soldiers closing in. Just then, Zorro's avengers manage to intercede on his behalf, and they tell the governor about all the injustice that's been going on in town. The governor has a change of heart, and he agrees to pardon Zorro. Upon hearing this, Zorro emerges from the tavern and he unmasks himself, revealing himself to be none other than Don Diego. Everyone is astonished to learn this secret, and Diego declares that Zorro's days are now over. He and Lolita plan to be married, and the story ends. The book keeps Zorro's identity a secret from the audience until the end. The movie, however, lets the audience in on the secret from the beginning. Disney's Zorro begins with Diego returning home after three years studying abroad in Spain. He finds his hometown now in the grip of the tyrannical Capitan Monastario, and decides to defeat the man by cunning. If you're gonna clothe yourself in the skin of the lion, put on that other fox. Well, from now on, I shall be Zorro, the fox. Diego meets the Comandante, greets his old friend, Sergeant Garcia, and reunites with his father, convincing all of them that he's now a timid bookworm. In secret, however, he dons a mask and cloak and rides out as El Zorro. His first mission is to rescue a local patriot named Don Nacho Torres. He's just been arrested and Zorro goes to the Cuartel to free him. Zorro outwits Sergeant Garcia and outfights Monastario. He rescues Don Nacho from prison and he escapes back to the Bat Cave or Fox Cave. And in revenge, Monastario arrests Don Nacho's wife and daughter. Diego's father hears about this and he is outraged. He recruits his fellow caballeros and asks them to come to his home and plan a jailbreak. When the caballeros arrive to stage their jailbreak, the soldiers are waiting for them. Alejandro is wounded in battle, but Zorro rescues him. 
Then Don Nacho returns, having convinced the governor to see to it that Nacho and his fellow patriots get a fair trial. However, the governor's judge is still on his way to Los Angeles, so Monasterio rushes to try Nacho and Alejandro before the judge can arrive. He appoints his own friend to serve as judge in the meantime, and he would have gotten away with it too if that pesky Zorro hadn't snuck through the back and forced the corrupt judge to pronounce the men not guilty. Monasterio's next scheme is to ruin Zorro's good name and turn the local people against the outlaw. He has a criminal pose as Zorro and rob the tavern. But wouldn't you know it, Zorro shows up and defeats the imposter. Never one to learn from his mistakes, Monasterio tries again, and he sends his imposter to steal some jewels from the local mission church. When Diego hears about this, he and Bernardo hatch a scheme that, long story short, manages to pit Monasterio and his accomplice against each other. But the plan hits a snag. The imposter beats Monasterio in a duel, and he's about to skip town with the stolen jewels. Diego sees this, and he's forced to step in and fight the man as himself. He pretends to be a clumsy swordsman, while making just enough good moves to defeat his opponent. He recovers the stolen jewels and clears Zorro's good name. But now Monasterio suspects that Diego isn't the hapless scholar he pretends to be. Monasterio soon arrests Diego, and he accuses him of being Zorro. Just then, the Viceroy shows up. It turns out the Viceroy is a friend of Diego's, and he defends him, saying he couldn't possibly be Zorro. Angry, Monasterio forces Diego into a duel at the tavern. Just then, Zorro rides by outside, proving that he and Diego must be two different people. It's actually Bernardo borrowing his boss's costume, but the ploy works. The Viceroy dismisses Monasterio, Diego is exonerated, and the jovial Sergeant Garcia becomes the new Comandante. Easter Eggs and Connections Although the two stories are quite different from each other, there are a few connections between The Mark of Zorro, the book, and The Sign of Zorro, the film. For example, Don Nacho and his family are sort of stand-ins for the Pulidos. And although the three of them never share a cell like the Pulidos do in the book, Zorro and the Caballeros do help spring them all from jail. Speaking of which, the jailbreak the Caballeros stage in the movie is a lot like the one in the book. Except in the movie, the Caballeros aren't actually in league with Zorro, at least not officially, and things go south for the movie's Caballeros really quick. Zorro duels Monasterio several times in the movie, just as Zorro duels Ramon several times in the book. Finally, the Viceroy in the movie plays a role very similar to that of the Governor in the book. Both men intervene at the last minute to help Zorro right when he's been cornered by his enemies. Differences as Disney often does when adapting stories, they changed many aspects of Zorro for the film. For example, the novel describes Zorro wearing a wide sombrero, a purple cloak, and a mask that covers his entire face. Disney chose to dress their Zorro in the costume that he'd worn in previous films. A black outfit, small sombrero, and a mask that covers only half of his face. Disney also changed Diego's personality. Disney's Diego pretends to be more of a lover than a fighter, but he's still suave and endearing. The book's Diego isn't a lover or a fighter. He's a sleepy, foppish wimp. Not only does he convince everyone that he's not Zorro, but he disappoints and annoys all of them too. One of the most unfortunate changes Disney made was eliminating virtually all female characters from their version of Zorro. Not only does the movie eliminate Lolita from the story, but it has hardly any dialogue from any female characters whatsoever. Some girls at the tavern get a few lines, and the Viceroy's daughter plays a small role at the end, but that's pretty much it. Where the original was part action-adventure, part love story, the movie is all action. Disney does let their Zorro do a lot more fighting than book Zorro gets to do, but there is no romance in the film and no strong female characters. Final Thoughts in case you couldn't tell, I am a big Zorro fan. His adventures combine three of my favorite genres, swashbuckler, western, and superhero. I mean, seriously, what's not to like? However, if you're unfamiliar with the character, like a lot of people are, I actually wouldn't recommend either the book or the Disney movie as a jumping off point. The book is very episodic, the prose is a bit dated, and I found Diego very, very unlikable. The movie is a lot better, but since it's a series of TV episodes that have been strung together, it really lacks flow. It feels a lot more like a rushed summary of a series 
than a cohesive film in its own right. The TV show has much better pacing and includes several stories in the Monasterio arc that were cut from the movie. The show also continues past the events of the film and introduces other villains for Zorro to battle. While the show is still very light on romance, it has a lot more of it than the film does. Fair warning, by today's standards, the show is pretty cheesy. Look out, Zorro! But it's still way better than it has any right to be. And now I suggest that you play one hand with Don Ramon. For what stakes? Your life, senor. You mean if I win, I... Precisely. You die. That's largely due to the high production value and the casting of Guy Williams in the lead role. Not only did Williams have a charismatic screen presence, but he'd trained in fencing years before being cast. You can tell he knows what he's doing whenever he draws a sword, and he's very believable playing the most skilled swordsman in California. Now, if you can't get past the 50s cheesiness of the show, there are many, many other Zorro adaptations out there, way more than I have time to mention. My personal favorite is the comic series published by Dynamite Comics. I also highly recommend checking out The Mask of Zorro, which is a movie that was written by the same writing duo that wrote Disney's Aladdin and the first four Pirates of the Caribbean movies. The Mask of Zorro is the Batman Beyond of the Zorro universe, and it actually works pretty well as an unofficial sequel to the Disney show. Anthony Hopkins takes up the role from Guy Williams, and he trains a new character, this Mexican bandit played by Antonio Banderas, to take on the Zorro mantle and become the new Zorro. If you'd prefer a straight up reboot of the Disney version, you may be in luck. Disney has announced plans to remake the series for Disney+, Plus, and they have hired Wilmer Valderrama to develop and star in the new series. Hopefully those plans actually come to fruition and we get new Zorro stories that will excite a new generation of fans. Until then, there are plenty of great Zorro stories to discover and rediscover. So that's my comparison of The Mark of Zorro with Disney's The Sign of Zorro. Please let me know what you thought of this video in the comments below and tell me whether you are a Zorro fan. Please tell me whether you've read the original stories and what you think of Disney's take on the character. Please let me know which Disney movies you'd like me to compare to their source material next. And as always, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.